ready for true happiness, for deep fulfillment, for feeling alive, on purpose, and in control of your life again, it's time to be the bold, brilliant, beautiful woman you were born to be. Welcome to the Purpose Girl Podcast. I'm women's happiness and life purpose expert, Karen Rockkind, and I'm going to teach you how to live on purpose, feel alive, and be happy in every aspect of life. I'm going to get real about my life and interview women who are living on purpose so that you can finally live yours. Welcome to the show. Hello, 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 Purpose Girls. I have such a juicy show for you today. It's Q&A day where I take the questions that you've been emailing me, the questions that you post when you reach out on my contact form on the Purpose Girl website or on our free Purpose Girls Facebook group, and I answer your questions. I love hearing from you. You might be able to tell that I have a nasty cold, like got some sort of virus, and I am practicing what I preach in this moment, right? That balance of feminine and masculine because the feminine says to stay in bed and care for yourself and nurture yourself. And so I did that earlier today. I canceled a whole bunch of things so that I could just be in bed and Josh tucked me in with an extra blanket and he brought me a warm drink in bed. And the masculine is is taking action and s- sticking to the commitment. And I have found that When I get off of a commitment, it's so much harder to come back, right? So let's say you are committed to an exercise program and you're really into it. This happened to me last year. I was adding mileage every week to my runs and I got up to 10 miles and I felt like such a rock star. And then we went out of town for a couple of weeks and it was harder to get my mileage in and to go up to 12. And so then I just stopped. But if I kept going, I would have been able to run another marathon last summer. So it's like, oh, it's so hard to get back on once you stop. And maybe you've had that experience with a food plan or with a goal. Like, let's say you started a blog at some point and you were rocking and rolling. You got like five blog entries done and then good, like understandable things took you out of the way. Maybe your kids, you know, needed you or you got sick or something happened and then it's so much harder to pick something back up. And this happens so often, right? You're like on a good food plan and then you eat a donut and you go, oh, forget it, I won't go back on. So I am still doing this episode for you, with you, because I wanna honor the importance of consistency in purpose. And I wanna honor my commitment to you and to me and to our community. Our community is growing. And so hopefully you'll either find my voice sick voice, super sexy, or you'll just be able to tolerate it because we have such a good show for you today. First, I have to thank you. We have been doing the Purpose Girl podcast for just about a year, not quite, but almost a year, and we've just reached 50,000 downloads, and I'm like blown away, okay? This is like, you don't even understand. Like, I- I'm in my jammies because, of course, I'm doing self-care while I do this podcast, and I'm just so grateful because I had no idea what would happen when I launched the Purpose Girl podcast. And I get emails, I hear from women all over the world, Singapore, Malta, Philippines, you know, all over the United States, all over Canada, all over Europe. And we really are building this community. We really are changing the world one woman at a time. And make no mistake, every download matters. Every time you subscribe, it matters. Every time you leave a review, it matters because the more downloads, the more subscribers, and the more reviews, the more women who are searching for a podcast and a community that will support them, they go, oh, this must be something because look at how many downloads they have. Look at how many reviews they have. So it really matters. And I am just blown away and I am honored. And yes, I have a tear in my eye because I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful that you love this podcast, and you love this community. That said, if you have not yet joined our free Purpose Girls Facebook group, please do so. What are you waiting for, girl? Like, it is a growing community. My team and I, we post something every day or at least every other day. On Mondays, we post a motivational Monday quote and something to get you thinking about your week. Wednesday, we do Women Crush Wednesday, which is bragging on one of our members. So it might be you and sharing your story so we can all get to know each other. Friday is the day for all of us to brag about an accomplishment that we had and cheerlead each other. Sunday is self-care day. So we 
are very active and ideally the community is going to keep growing and we want to hear from you. We want you all to feel comfortable posting on the Purpose Girls Facebook group saying, hey, I'm having a crappy day. I need some love. Or, hey, I just, you know, signed a big contract for my company and, you know, I, you want to be celebrated. So we want it all in the Purpose Girls Facebook groups, totally free. So please check that out. Before I get into the Q&As, and I have such good Q&As, I mean, you guys have asked me questions about how to switch careers. You've asked me questions about what to do with your weight when you um, have been struggling with your weight. You've been asking me questions about relationship. You've been asking me some personal questions. So all that is coming up. And before I do it, of course, I want to read the review of the week. This review just (laughs) seriously brought me to tears. And the reason, again, that I read this is because I want to honor you. So our review of the week, yes, 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 all caps, exclamation point. That's totally how I write, girl, so thank you. I religiously start my morning commute with Karen. The few times I have not, I can see the difference in the energy I bring to my day. I'm an adopted Pacific Island American, Philippines, a seemingly very active purpose girl country, yes, indeed, who survived sexual abuse and got pregnant at 16. Oh, gosh, I want to, I just want to hug you. I have only been a devoted purpose girl for a few months, but every episode I have listened to, I make a meaningful connection. Karen, thank you for leaving the sharks and helping me become purposeful. You are my virtual coffee before I hit the office, Keurig, XO, Jackie Squared in the United States. Jackie, I am wrapping you in my arms. I am holding you. What you have been through and the fact that you are still standing, you are still going, you are still taking care of everything you need to just shows what a purpose girl you are. You are brave and bold and beautiful. And I'm so glad that this podcast is giving you your morning shot of caffeine in the day. I love that. All of you, if you have not yet left a review, I read these reviews because I want to honor you. I want to thank you and show all of us how we're a growing community. So if you have not yet left a review, pause this for just two minutes, go on over to Apple Podcasts and type a five-star review. One sentence, two sentence, again, it helps to build our community. So thanks, Jackie. Thanks to all of you. I love you all so much. Let's get into our Q&As. Okay, our first question. So I've been getting a lot of questions about weight and weight loss and feeling good in your body. And it might be because I, every month, go onto a radio show, The Taylor Strucker Show, and weight comes up a lot. And so I'm just going to take all of your questions there and put it into basically one question, which is, I've been overweight for a long time and I can't seem to lose it. And several of you say, I don't want my children, maybe you don't want your daughters or your sons to see me like this or to feel this about myself. What do I do? So to all of you out there that are struggling with this, I want to wrap my arms around you first and foremost. And I wish I was standing in front of you and could look into your beautiful eyes and to look at your gorgeous body and to tell you, you are beautiful. It's not that you're gonna be beautiful when you're 20 pounds less. It's not that you're gonna be beautiful when you're 30 pounds less. It's that you're beautiful right now, both inside and out. So I am not a nutritionist or a doctor, so this is not medical advice. If you want medical advice, you know, please call call your licensed professional. That's super important. But what I have found with women in this issue are a few things. Number one, there is so much shaming that happens in our world, our society around women's bodies, not around men's bodies, right? Like I'm not saying that no men have eating disorders or that every man feels great about his body, but think about how much shaming we all grow up with. From the time we are little girls, we are looking at Teen Magazine and they're telling us how to lose lose five pounds. Well, who reads Teen Magazine? It's like 10-year-olds. It's not even like 16-year-olds. We're reading Cosmo from the time that we're 13, and that's telling us again about our body, our weight. We're constantly looking at advertisements that tell women that they're too fat, they're too old, you need to color your hair, you need to change your eyes, you need to, I mean, all this kind of stuff, right? I mean, that's what the makeup industry, that's what the beauty industry, that's what advertising has really been built on. Women are the major consumers. We buy more than men do. So it's targeted at us and really targeting on a core biological desire and fear. So I've been reading this book called The Female Brain that I highly recommend. It just so explains women and why we are the way that we are and the differences between the female brain and the male brain. I've been reading this incredible book 
And in it, she talks about how from the time a girl reaches puberty, she's all about finding a mate, right? It's like, that's why girls become boy crazy. And that's why girls also start to become so into their bodies. And do I look good enough? Do I not look good enough? And it's actually because if we go back into ancient times, girls got married when they were 13 and they started to have babies as soon as they could have their period. So it's actually very natural for us to care about how we look. What's not natural is to measure ourselves against some sort of standard that was set not by anything biological, not by God or goddess or universe or however you think of it, but by the world that we live in today. And we have to understand that this is more of a mental issue and an emotional issue than it is actually a physical issue. At least that's what I find when I talk to women. Because I'm guessing that you know what to eat, right? We hear it all the time, eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, eat all colors of the rainbow, mostly plant-based diet. You know, we know what to eat. And probably, you probably know that you're supposed to move your body, right? That, you know, it's the body needs to move, that our ancestors, they would walk five to 10 miles a day because they were hunters and gatherers and wandering people. So this was a natural thing, right, for our bodies to move. And so that's how our brains best function is if we move when you're, do, when you're moving, you're creating something called a, a protein called BDNF, which is like miracle grow on your brain. So I'm guessing that if this is a challenge for you, you know what you're supposed to eat and you know you're supposed to move your body. And I say supposed to, you know, that that's kind of how our bodies work. So that's not the issue. What I have found with so many women is that the issue is what's underneath, right? It's the old stories that you were told as a child or the old stories that you've adopted, you've taken on and cemented in your brain about what you're supposed to look like. So one of my clients, her parents took her to Weight Watchers when she was eight years old. So it was always in her mind that she was supposed to be different, that her body was not good enough as it was. When if you look at her body, she's a beautiful woman, beautiful. She has a beautiful body. And it's so interesting because we can look at different cultures and different body shapes are honored, right? In American culture, a teeny, teeny body with big boobs and <laughs> is honored. And that's a beautiful body. And there are more body types that are beautiful than just the one. We could go to other cultures where having a more voluptuous body, having round curves is honored because that means that you are abundant and can afford a lot of food. You could go into any art museum and walk through the halls and see that in olden times, in previous times, a round woman was honored. So it's like we want to really understand that this is more what's stuck in your mind about who you're supposed to be as an old story and that there's so much emotional shaming around this. And that what really we need to do for our weight, yeah, because you already know, you know what to eat, you know. And underneath that, what I recommend is that you come to know what are the old stories. What did you hear growing up? What did you learn from society or from your community or from school or from the other kids about what is not right with you or your body? And then what we need to do is then give our little selves, right? The young, There's a little Karen in me. There's a little someone in you. Give your little self the love that she needed then, right? So when I was on this radio show, the the host, Taylor, was talking about how she knows someone whose parents would hide food, lock the food in one cabinet, and she wasn't allowed to have that food, right? Everybody else in the house was, but she wasn't. And so she, again, there was shaming there. And all that's going to do is make a kid want to eat more, right? Because there's the forbidden fruit and then just feel bad. So what we want to do is you want to go into that eight-year-old self or 10-year-old self who felt so ashamed and become the mother to her now. Ask yourself, what did she need to hear then? Did she need to hear you're beautiful? Did she need to hear you're strong? Did she need to hear you're healthy? Did she need to hear, I love you as you are? Did she need to hear that every body shape is beautiful? Did she need to see pictures of gorgeous, curvy women? Or in the case of one of my former students, she was she was always told she was too thin. 
So that was her thing, right? So maybe your younger self needed to see pictures of other gorgeous women who were dressed confidently and walking around feeling awesome about themselves in no matter what size they are. Because confidence is pure beauty. I see so many Instagram accounts of women who are all different sizes, but they are so confident, they're freaking rocking it, right? So maybe they're wearing the red lipstick or they're showing off their cleavage. They're wearing skin tight or bikinis and looking so good. I'm like, I will have what she is having, right? Even though my body might be smaller. So really get in touch with that younger self and what does she need to see in order to really love herself? And then Really ask yourself, what does health mean to me? How would I feel if I was my most vibrant, healthy self? What would I do? What are the things I would say to myself? What are the old stories I would literally burn up? And I want you to write them down, take them into a fire and burn up that shit, right? What are the new stories that I want to write about myself? What's the new thing I want to say about my body? And I do exercises where I literally will look in the mirror and just look in my eyes and tell myself, I love you. I love you. I love you. Kindly, sweetly, or I'll get into the bathtub and I will touch different parts of my body. And I will say, I love you. So over the winter, I gained a few pounds. And so right now I'm like touching the the muffin top, right? The stuff that's hanging over my pants. And I'm going, I love you. I love you. The more we love ourselves as is, the more we actually want to take care of our bodies. We want to be healthy. And listen, there are marathon runners who are all different weights and all different body shapes. So the key here, right, is that emotional story, giving yourself the love, showing yourself the pictures. And then I say, let someone take you out for like a rockin' shopping trip or take yourself, take yourself to, you know, a lingerie store where you try on a beautiful, sexy bra and you red lipstick and you like really let yourself feel that beautiful. The more beautiful you feel, the more you will want to do the things that you quote unquote know that you should. So there's so much to say here. And of course, if you need help with this, then work with somebody, right? Find a self-love coach or work with a, a nutritionist who gets to the deeper issues that you are worthy of loving yourself. Okay, question number two. I've been at my job for 10 years and in the same line of work for 20. It's just not doing it for me anymore but I don't even know where to start with what else I would want to do. So where do I start? I love this question because, you know, it kills me that in our society, we ask 18 year olds to know what do you want to do for the rest of your life? You know, and it's like you can start doing something and then say, okay, like I've done all that I wanted to do there. And I want to like, I want to know what's next. But so often if we've gotten started in something like this beautiful woman has, you don't even know where to go. So What we want to do at this point, right, is first of all, we want to pause and step back. So what I see happen way too often is that when someone is unhappy in their job, right, because they don't like their boss or you don't like the people that you work with or you're just sick of whatever it is or you've reached your potential there, they just start looking for another job because in our society we need money. So it makes sense. But then what typically ends up happening is that then someone just takes another job and then they're at that job. It's okay for six months or two years. And then it's like, oh, no, that wasn't it. And then keep switching. And often what happens is then you start getting into sh- you're at the next job shorter and shorter and shorter amount of time. So what we want to do instead is we want to actually take this as a moment of pause, as a moment to say, you know, I probably haven't evaluated who I am in a long time. And I'm not the same person that I was at 18. I think it's a crime in our society. We like ask kids at 18, if you want to be a doctor, you've got to know right now. Or if you want to be an engineer, you've got to know right now. And so often you do something and then you're like, okay, I've done what I can do there. And so to this beautiful listener, what I want you to do is to really use this as an opportunity to pause. Right now, your current job is paying you and let's just consider them your first investor in your next life decision, in your next life change, right? Try if you can to not take that work home with you and not get too frustrated about the politics. It's going to keep like just feeding you right now. Or if you can and you can afford it, then go ahead and turn in your notice. But the key is that the, your primary job right now is to pause and take a step back and really get to know yourself now. 
Now is the time to really say, what do I value now? What's most important to me now? What's, what do I value in my life? What do I value in a workplace? Now is the time to step back and go, you know, who am I? What are my strengths? What lights me up? When in my whole life have I felt alive and juicy? At this point in my life, what are the causes that like really break my heart or make me want to go do something about them? So now is the time to go through a personal discovery process. And this is actually the bulk of what I do in Purpose Girl Coaching is like we will get someone to, I will get them to what job they want, but we back ourselves into it by first pausing and really getting to know yourself and love who you actually are now. And going through a number of different exercises from your strengths and what they tell you to looking at your peak experiences when you've been your best at your life. And you could go back to when you were 10. One of my clients, when she, when we were doing the step back process for her, she remembered one of her favorite times was when she was planning her high school prom and it just lit her up. It made her so excited and it was totally different than what she had been doing in work. And so we started to dive into, well, what, what did that prom experience give you? What did that mean to you? And then we start stringing, stringing the information together to find themes. Another one of my clients, when she looked at what really like lit her up in her life, one of them had to do with a workplace, but others had to do with experiences like, like a family had moved in next door to her that didn't speak English. And so she just, there was a little girl there and she took it upon herself every week to go and talk English with the little girl and kind of teach her some English. And it just lit her up. And what we found when we looked at all these different experiences was that there was a theme of mentoring others. And so you can really take a look. There are a number of different tools and exercises. And if you don't know where to start, then, you know, if you haven't gone to my website and downloaded the free Living on Purpose guide, it asks you a lot of questions. Or start by taking the Strength Survey, VIA, Values and Action Survey of Character Strengths, which will just tell you your top, not strengths in terms of talents, right? So talents are what you do. That's like you write well, or you are a great public speaker, or you're great with numbers. Those are talents and skills. Strengths are who you be. It's like how you show up. You're creative. You're kind. This is the time to step back and say, who am I now? What are my strengths? What are my values? What lights me up? What juices me? What are old dreams that I've had? And to really go through that self-discovery process. And then, right, it's like, a, what, what really is my purpose? Like, what is mine to do? And it doesn't mean a job title like accountant or architect. You may, you'll, you'll get there. What it means, purpose, is like the action of impacting the world. Like that you are here to build others up or you're here to help support people. And then we figure out the jobs for that. So now is a great time to do that kind of work. And the truth is, like, we don't ever learn that. We take school for many years, and there's math classes, and there's language classes, and there's science classes. There's no class on you and who you are. That was actually what I applied to graduate school on was this idea that I wanted to create a class that every college freshman would have to take in the world. And it was a class all about them. Who are you? your strengths, everything I've just been talking about, because then maybe they would choose a career that really fit them instead of what they thought they were supposed to do or what others told them. And by the way, it shouldn't just be for college freshmen. It should be something that you revisit every 10 years. And there aren't a lot of opportunities like that. We have to make them for ourselves. And yes, it takes time. It's not a matter of if you have time. It's a matter of if you have time not to. Life is short. And I mentioned this with the last question about weight. You know, someone, when, when you all write to me about your weight or about anything and what you want for your kids, like, what do you want your kids to see? Do you want them to see someone who loves themselves and loves their work and is excited and feels like they're making a contribution and living on purpose and following their dreams? Or do you want them to see someone who's like, oh, I just do this job. I, you know, I'm not into it. And the same goes for, for the weight question, even though we're off of that. You know, what do you want them to see? What do you want them, right, to experience? Because they're learning not from what you say, but from what you do. And so it's so great for everyone. It's scary. I'm not going to say that this is not scary. I've done it and I do it often. 
every year I actually take this pause and I kind of have a check in with who am I and what do I desire and what's true for me now. So now is such a good time. And there are tools out there, like I said, my free living on purpose guide. If you have not downloaded that, then do so. There are other tools, like I have a living on purpose course on my website. It's, you know, a series of videos that will help you go deeper and deeper into this. And it's very reasonably priced. Or you can find other tools that are not mine. Totally cool too, right? Like there are a lot of tools. And if you need help, you know, in order for me to really figure out my purpose and take that step back when I was in that same place where I wasn't into my career and didn't know what to do, I hired a coach. And listen, when I first called this coach, I've told this story before on the podcast and he told me his price. I was like, are you crazy? You know, and I said, no. But then I went back and looked at all my self-help books and, you know, nothing changed for a month. So I called him back and I was like, all right, you know, and so having him ask me the right questions and reflect back to me what he heard and help me take all the puzzle pieces that were in my mind and create an actual, oh, this is the career that I want, which is the career that I am doing now, was so helpful. So get help, whether it's worksheets, whether it's programs you can get online from me or someone else. I'm totally cool with that. Or it's a coach with me or someone else. Give yourself the opportunity. Give yourself the gift of doing it. Right? Yeah, it's going to take you know, an hour, a couple hours a week to like ask yourself some of these questions to do the journaling and my goodness, it is worth it. So it's not if you have the time, it's are you willing to really give yourself and your family and everybody you love this gift of you being your best self? Third question is a personal one. Someone asked, how did I know that I was bisexual and what was it like to come out? So this has been a big process for me because When I was young, I didn't question, do I like boys or do I like girls? Now, when I go back, I'm going to share something I've never shared before. I actually remember when I was in second grade and a little girlfriend and I, maybe fourth grade, anyway, we were very young. um, We set up in her basement, we set up gymnastics mats around us, made like a little fort, took off our clothes and looked at each other. And we even did some touching. And it was a really profound experience that I will never forget. And I don't know if my younger self then was like, am I gay? I don't even know if I knew what that was. And I actually now know that it's very normal. So any of you who have kids out there or nieces or nephews, it's very normal for little kids to explore their own bodies and other bodies. Of course, they're curious. So I did have that in mind and knew that that was part of my experience And then I didn't really question it. Then I was in middle school and liked boys. And remember the first time a boy asked me out to go. That was what they used to say, right? (laughs) Will you go with me? His name was Matt. And it was at a dance. And then I was sleeping at my grandmother's that night. And I remember not sleeping. I was on her pullout couch. And I was like, so excited about my new boy, Matt, you know, my new boyfriend that I was going with. So, you know, I, I didn't really question that. And then when I was in high school, again, still thought of boys, but I became very, very, very close friends with this girl. And over time, we became best of friends. And then she stopped talking to me one day and I thought I did something wrong. I thought, are you mad at me? What did I do? And then one day she showed up to the pizza restaurant I was working at with a letter And I'm reading through it, blah, 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 blah. I love you. And I'm like, oh, I love you too. And honestly, my 16-year-old brain didn't think anything of it. And then she's like, no, I really love you. And then it was a series of months of trying to understand, like, what does that mean? Do I feel the same way? And I knew I loved her. like, And I didn't know what kind of love it was, but we would talk a lot. And we then we would start, like, kind of cuddling on the couch, not any kind of touch- Um, not any touch on breasts or on her pussies, just, you know, gentle, loving touch, um, hugging. And the closer we got, the more I felt absolute positive love in my heart, like in love. And I knew I love her. And I did not want to be gay. I did not want anyone to think I was gay. But I loved her. And so we started a secret relationship. And Uh, We were in a group of friends. None of our friends knew. And we were absolutely positively madly in love. I remember the first time we ever made out and it was hot. And um, 
then the next day I flew to Florida to be with my family over Christmas break. And I remember going to a payphone and calling her collect because I was like so in love. But I knew that I was like really terrified about what that meant. And I was very confused because we had great sex, her and I. But when I would look at guys, I was more physically attracted to guys than I was to girls. Like there weren't other girls that I was lusting after or physically attracted to. There were more boys. It was boys. And so it was very confusing for me. And I didn't really want to face any sort of label because at the time, girls did not go with girls to prom. Like from what I understand, it's very different now. There's a lot of group dates going on and boys with boys, girls with girls, them with them, like trans every, I mean, and I'm pro everything, um, but it's, you know, everything goes now. And so I didn't want to face it. And um, I did break up with her at some point. And that's when she actually started becoming abusive. Um, she used to hit me to keep me in the relationship. And to be honest, it's something that, you know, I still process more than 20 years later. So I knew that what I then wanted was just to be with a guy. Like, where's my Prince Charming who's going to come on a white horse and save me from this crazy situation? And so I actually shut off and, and I went to college my freshman year. I met my first husband, tall, dark hair, good looking, frat guy, like, you know, big shoulder, like perfect, quote unquote, in so many ways. So I shut off what I had had with her and shut off the idea that I would possibly be anything but straight. And it was years later. It was actually when he and I were getting a divorce and I was helping a friend who worked for a domestic violence shelter. Uh, she was doing a, a, a rally and I went with her to help her volunteer. And afterwards there was an open mic night and a woman got up and talked about how her girlfriend had hit her. And I mean, my mouth fell to the floor. I started crying. I'm like, oh my God, that's what happened to me. And that really began, and it was while I was going through my divorce. So there was a lot going on at that point. But that really, that was my mid-20s. And that really began my journey to try to understand my own sexuality. And it took many, many, many years for me to understand where I am. And this is how I see it. I believe that we're all on a spectrum, there's actually a researcher, um, it's called the Kinsey scale, that we're all on a spectrum that very, very, very few people, if any, are 100% gay or 100% straight. <laughs> and now we know that there are many things in, in between. I believe that we can all love anybody because love is an, is an emotion in the heart and that we can be soulmates with many people, that your soul may have had lots of different relationships in lots of different lives. And... Of course, I have no, this is not a positive psychology, like scientific proof. This is just my belief. And I believe that I am somewhere in the middle. And what's actually helped me to get more comfortable and really finally using the term bisexual, believe it or not, was meeting Josh. And because he's so open and Josh followed the dead when he was younger. He had like hair down to his butt. Like he was a very open guy. And being in the company and in the arms and in the love of a man who was that comfortable with sexuality, that comfortable with openness, with all things go, actually made it so that I could comfortably say, I am bisexual. Now, as weird as that is, that it took my male straight husband for me to say that, he has made it comfortable for me to be my whole self. You know, if God forbid something happens to Josh, I don't know who I will love after that. It could be a woman. It could be trans. It could be a man. I don't know. I only know that I am able to love anybody. And I actually believe that most of us are. And for the person who asked me this question, thank you for asking me something so personal. And if this is something that you're struggling with, then I just want you to know that you are exactly the person that you were born to be. I was born to be bisexual. That's part of who I am. And it's part of my beauty. It's part of what makes me special and unique. And as confusing as it was, and as much of a struggle as it was, I now have the understanding that it doesn't have to be a struggle. Because the more I can accept and love this part of me, the happier and more confident I am. And so 
I used to be worried that girlfriends would be like worried to change in front of me if they knew I was bisexual. And no, they're not. Or that I couldn't snuggle up and hug a woman on the couch, which I love to do like with my friend Stacy. Nope, she's not worried about it at all, right? Because I'm not like hitting on them. Um, so just know that you are perfect as is, right? This is not a flaw. This is not an imperfection. You were born exactly as you were meant to because this is purpose. If we were all born the same, first of all, it'd be so boring. Second of all, then what? We would all be like cogs in a wheel. We would all just be like robots. This world and purpose is about making an impact. It's about healing the world. It's about rising up and being the vibration of love that this world needs. And the way that we do that is to really honor and love ourselves, who we actually are. And so it's a big, scary journey. I want to be there for you. Please feel free to email me, go on my website, send me a note if this is something that you're thinking about, just so I, you know that you have someone who's holding you and loving you and that you are not alone. And by the way, if your kids are going through this, then even if it's different than your own experience, you know, loving them as is and understanding that this is part of what makes them special and offering support, your own ear for them to talk to, offering them that it's okay no matter who they love, offering them to talk to a therapist is so good because that's what we want. We want everyone living their full bright light. And if you have to suppress any part of you, right? If, if I suppress my bisexuality, then I'm not shining as brightly and therefore radiating light to the rest of the world because we can't just suppress one part of us. We don't work that way. We end up then suppressing all parts of us because we become smaller. And I want every single one of you and every single person you touch to be big and bright and radiating. Like that's purpose. Radiating your light is your purpose. So thank you for asking me that question. Last question, how do I deal with failure? Okay, so first of all, I have to be clear that I fail at stuff all the time. There are so many coaches and podcasters and YouTubers and, you know, pop celebrities that make it seem like they succeed only and that everything that they touch is gold. And maybe it is. Like, I don't know. I'm not inside of their bank account. I'm not inside their home or inside their head. But I'm pretty much going to call BS on that <laughs> because the truth is, is that anytime you're doing something new, you will probably have a quote unquote failure. The key is that it's not a failure. It's an opportunity to learn, right? A mistake is a mistake. And this has been a huge thing for me to learn. I have been filled with so much shame when I have failed at different things. Well, I will tell you, I came onto this podcast just a couple of months ago to tell you about our mother-daughter retreat, and we didn't get the signups that we needed, so we're not doing it, right? And old Karen would have been mortified to tell you that I launched something that did not succeed, that totally failed. However, new and improved Karen, right? <laughs> my All my growth says, why would I be ashamed of that? I went for it. I felt something in my heart and soul that would be important and is needed. And I still believe that this is needed. It may have been that we didn't give it a lot of time. It may, you know, it was short notice. It may have been financial. I don't know yet. I'd love to hear from you why, why you didn't sign up. But the important thing is that I went for it. And I don't have to sit here and say, oh, I, I have all these ideas, but I'm just too afraid. I learned after it was between the time that I knew I wanted to follow this dream to empower women around the globe, to be their most purposeful selves, their happiest selves. From the time I knew that that was my dream until the time that I actually took the leap to go back to grad school was eight years. And those eight years were incredibly painful. They were incredibly painful because I would look in the mirror every day and know that I was lying to myself because I would say, it's okay, I don't really need it. They were incredibly painful because I became depressed because I was so scared and so ashamed of my fear that I became horribly depressed. Then I felt like a big loser because I wasn't going for my dreams. So it's like, we can't have it both ways. We can't be a loser if we don't go for our dreams and then be a loser if we do go for our dreams, right? It, it can't work like that. However, that's our 
reptilian fear brain. Fear brain, right? I've told you all before about negativity bias, that we go negative before we go positive, that the negative is stronger, and that we've built these critical voices in our head with our fear brain because it's trying to keep you safe. It's trying to protect you from getting hurt. And fear brain is worried that if you launch a retreat and people don't sign up, then you will feel so ashamed and mortified. And if you're ashamed and mortified, then people won't love you, right? Like the whole basic, the most basic need is to belong, to be loved, to belong to your tribe. That was what our ancestors needed in order to survive. So if you're afraid that, oh my God, if people find out I launched this blog and then I stop doing it, oh my God, that's too much because now people won't love me or they'll think that I'm a loser, then you're never gonna do it. But the thing is then we add onto it, we pile on ourselves added shame, added self-hatred by then calling ourselves a loser for never going for it, right? So it's like we get so stuck in that. And so I wanna be sure that I am very clear that I have failures. I have failures. In fact, Josh and I were just talking about this because the mother-daughter retreat, we didn't get enough signups and we, so it was quote unquote a failure. And we had signed up for this course that we thought was gonna be awesome and it didn't produce for us what we were hoping. So we spent like two months this year working on stuff that didn't produce. And I said to him, God, like this is like those old feelings or old fears of failure. And he said, and this is what it is to be an entrepreneur, right? Some ideas are gonna skyrocket and some ideas are not. And it's okay. And I felt so held. I was like, you're right. It's totally okay. And a student of mine was just telling me how there is an entrepreneur. Oh, I wish I knew his name. He's like big, like he's a CEO of some big companies. And when he sees his kids at night, either at dinner or when they go to bed, he asks them to tell him one success from the day and one failure. And he says, because if you didn't fail today, then you didn't try hard enough. You didn't take a risk. Right. So in positive psychology, there is a brilliant researcher named Carol Dweck. She's out of Stanford and she's written a book called Mindset. And this has become a very famous concept. She talks about fixed mindset and growth mindset. The fixed mindset is I'm either smart or I'm not. I'm beautiful or I'm not. I'm athletic or I'm not. Like it's a very fixed. There's a period at the end of the sentence. And this is really what leads to perfectionism. Um, And when we have that, The people who have that, and by the way, I am a recovering fixed mindset girl, we don't take risks because we're so afraid that someone's going to find out that we're a fraud, right? So my whole life I was told I was smart. So I was afraid to take harder classes. I was afraid to take more ice skating when I wasn't the best girl there. I was afraid of all this kind of stuff because I didn't want anyone else to find out that I wasn't as perfect as they thought I was. And this is how we get imposter syndrome. This is how we get the fraud feeling. When instead, there's another way to think. And this is what she calls a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is when we say, I can become as smart as I want to. I can read more books. I can listen to more tapes. I can expand my knowledge. Growth mindset is there's no such thing as failure because I'm always learning. I can always look back and say, well, what did I learn from that? What, what could I do differently next time? How else can I achieve? Like, so what she found in her research studies are that kids who have this fixed mindset, like you're either intelligent or you're not, they will not try harder puzzles. They would rather redo the one that they just did because they want to, oh, look, I did it. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I finished. And kids who have a growth mindset, when they were asked, would you like to redo the same puzzle or get a harder one? Those kids are like, why would I redo the one I already did? No, give me the harder one. I want to try it. Those kids are not worried about quote unquote failing. And so all of us, what we know are people who have this growth mindset, they end up being more successful. They also end up being healthier in many ways. And so we want to learn to adopt. I want to learn to adopt. This has been like daily practice for me over years. And I think I might be close to finally being there is to really have that growth mindset that can look at the example of the quote unquote failure of this retreat and go, no, there's a lot to learn from it. Like I would love to learn, you know, do people just not want that? Is, was the timing not right? Was it too expensive? Like whatever it might be, I would love to learn that and do it differently next time. And then to really applaud the heck out of myself that I went for it. And that's it is, you know, I think we're all so afraid of failure, but what our, our own personal failure, but then we love to watch TED Talks. Do you ever watch TED Talks? And what we love seeing are people who face 
horrible adversity, people who have failures, people who have challenges, and then they overcome them. They don't let those failures and challenges hold them down, right? They bounce back with resilience. They come back with post-traumatic growth, as I talked about a couple of episodes ago, the, the one about overcoming adversity. So we want to be that person. And when we can do that, wow, now we flourish. And it's amazing. Those are the most inspiring people in the world. And another key here, Brene Brown, who is an incredible researcher on vulnerability and shame, she talks about the difference between saying, I failed or this project failed. The difference between I'm bad or this thing was bad, this thing, this behavior or this project or whatever, right? So it's like not owning it. It doesn't mean you're a failure if something fails and it doesn't mean I am. So this question, how do I deal with failure? Well, I used to deal with it really poorly. I used to go into my bed and hide. So the first time I ever launched a group program, this was early on in my career of doing this, and no one signed up. I swear to God, I went to bed for like two days and I just put the covers over my head and I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm so ashamed. And the hilarious thing there is like, no one knew it didn't sell. Like who would have known? As far as anyone else knew, you know, 10 other women signed up and it was good to go. So great. But I was so ashamed. So the way I dealt with failure then was to hide. Then at some point I did what I always do, which is, okay, dust myself off, come back to my purpose. Why am I doing this? And it's that I believe that I have a message that can help women. I believe that I really can like help you to live your best life, to reach your full potential, to rock it out. Okay. Then a few months later, we're going to try it again. So I put out my group program and you know how many people signed up? Zero. Again, zero. (laughs) So again, I went to bed and I was like, "Ah, I can't do it. I can't do it. I wanted to give up. But I did it again. I dusted myself off got back to my purpose. Why am I doing this? Okay. So I put the group programs away for a little while. How else can I help women? What else can I do? Kept going with my newsletter, found a radio show that I could give regular advice on every month, put out that I'm coaching people, sent out notes to companies saying, this is how I can come and talk to your employees about being their best and grew other aspects of this purpose before I came back to the group program. And then the next time I launched the group program, three women signed up. I was like, yes right? And still, seven, eight years later, me doing this, and I have this podcast, and I have right have all these people who thank you, read my newsletter. I still don't sell out everything. And it's okay. And here's the thing. This is why I want all of you to join the Purpose Girls Facebook group, because I want us all on there saying, hey, I tried. I tried. And even if it didn't work this time, I want to applaud the holy you know what, out of you. I want to just applaud you and celebrate you. I want to just, you know, rave about you for trying. And I want other women in the community to do the same. And I want them to be inspired by you. And I want you to be inspired by them. So let's start talking about how we're living our purpose. Let's start talking about the failures that we have. Let's start talking about learning from them. Because that's where the gift really is. So Brene Brown, this shame researcher, she talks about Shame likes to hide in in dark corners. But the moment that you reach out in connection with someone you can trust and you say, hey, here is something that brought me shame. Shame can't live in that. Shame can't live in the light. So you connect in vulnerability. You have compassion for yourself that sounds like, it's okay, it's normal. This happens to everybody. And hey, I tried. I'm awesome for trying. So when you can do those things, And that's what I'm learning, and we're learning together. So there are more questions that will come in the next Q&A. I love hearing from you. Please send me your questions. You can send it on audio. Go to purposegirl.com forward slash voicemail, and I love hearing from you. You can send it on my website. Go to purposegirl.com. Go on the contact form and send me a question. Go over to the Purpose Girls Facebook group, totally free. Leave me questions there. My team will gather them all up, and we'll use them for the next Q&A. Also, I'm going to be doing some more Facebook Lives on there. So you'll want to, that's another great place to ask me questions. So I love hearing from you because I I want this podcast to be our podcast, not mine. Our community's podcast where you are getting the answers that you need to rock it out in this world, to really live your best life, to really live to that full potential. And I want to share with you the science of women's happiness. So with that, I thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to this episode of the Purpose Girl Podcast. I thank you for being part of this huge 
growing community. Join us over on the Free Purpose Girls Facebook group. If you have not gotten your Living on Purpose guide and my newsletter, go over to Purpose Girl, sign up for that, totally free. And then every week you'll get tips from me. Please find me on Instagram at Karen Rockhind. Please find me over the other way on Facebook is Coach Karen Rockhind, my business page. I post a bunch there too. Let's do this together. Most important thing you can do is to download this episode, to subscribe and leave that five-star review And then share this with your friends, with every woman you know, because that's what we're doing here at Purpose Girl. We are changing the world one woman at a time. I love you so, so, so much. I'm going to go back to bed now. Bye for now.